Are you a fan of the Iron Scissorman podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash And thank you.
Are you a fan of the Iron Scissor Men podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash ironscissormen. Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash ironscissormen. And thank you. Are you a fan of the Iron Scissor Men podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash ironscissormen. Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash ironscissormen. And thank you.
news, ops, and a little bit of paranoia. Welcome to the Iron Sysadmin Podcast. Welcome to tonight's episode, folks. I'm your host, Nate, as usual, and I'm joined by one of our usual co-hosts. Say hi, Uncle Mark. Hey, you nerds. How you doing tonight? And we've got a special guest, Alex Kretschmar, that is not pronounced Ooh. like it's a Klingon. Kretschmar! De- definitely no. <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, uh, Alex, you can just go ahead Spock. and give yourself Stand a quick intro. Feel free to plug Klingons. your... Let's see, that. and there's Mark already, trampling us all. <laughs> all right, Alex, go. Quick intro. Hi, I'm Alex. <laughs> I am co-host of the self-hosted podcast at selfhosted.show. Uh, I work with you two reprobates for my sins, I think. Wow. Uh, I do a bunch of uh, other stuff, blogging, writing. I wrote for Ars Technica recently on Home Assistant. Oh, that's uh, cool. Stuff like that. I enjoy drone racing and 3D printing and photography and music. I'm a drummer, so that's me. <laughs> drone racing. I, I think I've yeah. seen drone racing, but I've always looked at it as the sort of sport that my brain doesn't have enough dimensions to uh, to handle. Oh it's uh, well, for the one on the one hand, you know, a drug habit would be cheaper. On the <laughs> other hand, it's a lot of fun. So you have these, you wear these goggles, and in real time, the drone transmits a video field back to your glasses with like a few milliseconds, five or ten milliseconds latency. Uh, and you fly around a field and try not to crash into people. It's pretty fun. People. Or into not, people. Yeah, people. people by if people, I mean other drones. 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 Not actual <laughs> soft squishies. Not actual people, right? <laughs> that's that's crazy. And uh, you say you say that uh, a drug habit would be cheaper. Uh, I have an off-road, an automotive off-road habit. And uh, believe me, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I could drop 30 grand in a heartbeat and not be done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not quite up there with you on that, but yeah, uh, yeah. Well, that's that's the that's one of the nerd jerk jokes in the community. Introduce your kid to magic cards, and they'll never have enough money for drugs. Yeah, usually <laughs> it's uh, introduce your your uh, your kid to any automotive auto, uh, sport, and they won't have enough money for drugs. Yeah, there's there's several that can that you can yeah there are. Depend, there are depending on your cultural stance. Apparently, and background. apparently and drone racing whatnot. is one of those. Yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of evil drone racing, like, like, uh, like what are demolition derbies? Those were big when I was a kid. God, that sounds so expensive. They're, they're kind of passe right now, I think. Right? Like they were kind of a big deal in like the seventies and maybe into the eighties. I remember those as a kid derbies. in the eighties. Yeah, demolition do, derbies. Do you really have those anymore? Wasn't there a game, a video game, Destruction Derby? Absolutely, absolutely, there was. If that's the one I'm thinking of, you could race in a in an ice cream truck that had a large clown on top of it. <laughs> the best kind of ice cream truck. The best kind of ice cream truck. So well, anyway, one that came back out on iOS as well called Carmageddon, which I yes, think was pretty cool too. Yes, Carmageddon was another one. So um, a couple episodes back, ninety four, I think it was, uh, we talked about self hosting, and a bunch of you guys reached out and said, "Hey, there's this other show called the Self Hosted Podcast or something." <laughs> You guys should have this guy on the show. You guys could, could like, talk about self-hosting. And, you know, it turns out we work with Alex, and, you know, this was actually pretty easy to set up. It was just a matter of waiting until we all uh, aligned. So uh, I thought tonight we would just kind of go around uh, the, 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 the perspective we took last time was, does it still make sense to self-host? So I don't know. Why don't we, why don't we start there? You, you, run, you, are, you co-host a show that's all about self-hosting so what's your stance on that like does it make sense or have cloud providers eaten it up is it too easy to just go spin up an instance somewhere and it depends I... on you I mean, there's there's so many angles to this particular question it depends on the service in question it depends on the amount of time you have available it depends on your skill set it depends on a million different things right and, and i think the answer in general for me as a Linux nerd, is yes. However, there are some specific exceptions. Stuff like email. I'm never, I'm never going to bother self-hosting email because that needs to be 99.9 million nines uptime. Yeah. I always need to be able to receive email, no matter what's happened to my VPS provider, my ISP at home, whatever it might be. So I'm quite happy to sign over that portion. I say happy. 
I'm okay with signing over that portion of the self-hosting universe to Uncle Google. However, no relation whole... to me. <laughs> However, no relation to Uncle Mark. Angle too, right? <laughs> I mean, the the general the general gist of this argument goes: you're trading your time and effort for money and convenience generally and if there isn't money it's your data so with google with gmail as the the prime example if you're okay with using gmail you're basically saying it's okay for google to know everything about you and your life that's a valid approach so um i i used to self-host email <laughs> there's a reason i don't anymore so that that really that really hits um, I also used to professionally host email when I worked at the college and when I worked at an ISP before that. So uh, you're you're right. Um, one of our co-hosts, Jason, he still self-hosts his email, and uh, it's it can be a nightmare. Yeah. But then there are other services like Plex, for example, or Nextcloud, or uh, there's another one I've started using called Paperless, which is a, a like a digital filing cabinet which has OCR stuff. There's a lot of this stuff that's just actually freaking cool, right? Yeah, I can go through any letter that I've scanned through this app now using OCR and find the exact word in that document, and it never leaves cool. my server. Right, and yeah. I love that. I can go. I was watching um, uh, a documentary called now using OCR. I've forgotten. It had Snowden in it. It's quite recent. Um, the truth is out there or something to do with the truth i can't remember the name okay um and essentially it's just a huge massive wake-up call to say it was about social media actually it's called the social something um was it the one on netflix that i haven't watched yet but yeah, everybody tells yeah, me yeah. i should watch the yeah. social dilemma social dilemma that's it yeah and it's all about how when you start making these trade-offs against uh you know giving the algorithms control over what you see and what you do eventually and there was a phrase that snowden used of that was that eventually these algorithms will control what you believe and i just it's so insidious and it's happened so slowly and it's so dangerous that it, it is literally tearing apart the social fabric of society absolutely know it yeah, look, I mean, that's happening right now. Just just go sign up for a Facebook account and look at the crazy that's going on in there. Yeah, <laughs> My absolutely. wife has to keep telling me to stop engaging with the crazy anti-vaxxers because it's just... Yeah, it's probably good for your blood pressure, if nothing yeah. else. Yeah, yeah, right. She's like, would you just stop? Just stop. Okay. But the other thing is, the other angle about self-hosting is it got me the job I have today. That might sound a bit silly to you, but... No, I, that completely resonates. A few resonates. years ago... Uh, was doing a computer science master's. And during that year, I started messing around with servers and Linux and compiling kernels and doing stuff like GPU pass-through back when it was actually really difficult and mm -hmm. you had to have the exact specific BIOS revision, all that kind of crap. And in that year, I, I built a server running Unraid. And what I wanted to do was do GPU pass-through with, with Unraid because I was a poor student. I couldn't afford a desktop computer. So I thought, right, I can afford a GPU, you know, like a hundred pounds or something, throw that in the system and then do pass through. And I've got a free computer. Why wouldn't I do this? And in, in, in that year, uh, not only did I discover how awesome Linux was, but then I discovered how difficult VMs can be to administer <laughs> if you're a, an idiot newbie like I was back uh -huh. then. Mm. And so what containers and Docker allowed me to do was operate a, at a level of competence well above where I actually was and get Plex up and running and some, you know, torrent stuff and just some other, you know, basic stuff that, that you do at the beginning. And over time, that kind of progressed into founding Linux server.io, which then kind of progressed into founding the self-hosted podcast. And, you know, during that time, I've done a lot of blogging and writing and stuff. But those skills I learned in that master's year uh, where I figured out about VMs versus containers led me to land a DevOps job in London for a bank. This was fresh out of college, knowing diddly squat. Honestly, I have no idea why they hired me, but they did. And that then led to a proof of concept 
uh, with Docker versus OpenShift versus Mesosphere versus Rancher. And we selected OpenShift as part of that. Yay. And then we got a consulting team in and I worked with the Red Hat consultants on deploying it for this bank and then made some good relationships, ended up moving into Red Hat consulting myself in London. And here we are. <laughs> you know, so should you self-host? Yes, absolutely, because you're investing in yourself. If yeah, no so reason. it's it's really funny because I, I've told this story before on the on the show, and we, we keep talking about maybe having a show where each of us just shares sort of our quote-unquote origin story, if you want to call it that. But uh, I started very similar. My parents except, were killed outside yeah, right. the movie theater. Like late 90s, I was just really interested in, well, I, honestly, early 90s, I was really interested in computers, and I was too broke to afford a license for a Windows machine, right? So I found Linux because it was quote unquote free. I spent like 30 bucks to buy a Red Hat 5.0 uh, disc at a computer show. And uh, that's, you know, same deal. I spent hours just trying to figure out how to get the damn thing installed on my on my old 486, right? And then to get it up to the point where I had a, a desktop where I could do things, right? And then I'm like, what else can I do with this? And I started making servers out of it. And then people broke into those servers and destroyed them. And then I had to rebuild them. And then they broke into those and destroyed them. And that's how the 90s went. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But same so, deal, right? That's what got me into, into IT. I just really was curious about it. And I started doing stuff at home. Sorry, Mark. So you're I, trying to speak. I, I What's that, Mark? To speak, but Go I, ahead, but talk. Not, I, oh, my <laughs> word. No, so something Alex said a few minutes ago it was said almost in an apologetic manner, but it, it shouldn't be the I, the idea that um, I truly believe that to become really good at technology, you need to have some skin in the game. And and for me, um, before I had any actual Linux cred, when I was trying to get my first Linux job, I had messed with it by setting it up on a lab inside of Merck, but I had also, as silly as it sounds, when I was interviewing for my first Linux positions, I would I would bring in my laptop and show them the work I had done with this Neverwinter Nights server that I that I hosted. Oh right, I'd Never actually Winter founded Nights. it. My goodness, man. and the whole infrastructure behind it, the forums, the database link-ins, all this stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I'm basically running, I'm basically running a multi-server multi-service thing here and again this was in the this was in the early 2000s when that was actually friggin hard so as silly as things like that sound i i firmly believe that 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 having that experience even though it wasn't work experience that helped me to land my my first real linux job with merck i i also firmly believe this when i look at the most successful red hatters because that's where I've been for five years, right? The most successful Red Hatters are the are the nerds that have invested in a home lab and that get their hands dirty running stuff on it. And and I kind of got out of that for a little bit, but when Valheim, one of the current games I'm playing, launched, it coincided with me coming in coincided with me coming into upgrading my home lab. So I decided I was going to host a Valheim server for me and my friends. This was, be and, and I could have gone with Amazon or I could have gone with some third party service, right? Because you can pay a place 12 bucks a month. But here, here's my challenges with that. And, and then I'm going to get, I'm going to get off the soapbox shortly. I saw too many people who were paying a lot of these companies and the, the, the service was terrible, right? You, you, I think what happens is a lot of these places shove, they shove too much stuff onto shared farms. I ran into this experience on Amazon when I helped my daughter set up a a uh, an instance to do some computation for her chemistry stuff she was doing. She got a grant and they, she wanted to run some simulation, and the the machine would be running the simulation, and I'd look in top, and top showed that. The system was the the steel percentage was anywhere from fifty to eighty percent way too often. Now, if you don't know what that means, you're paying Amazon hourly for for a CPU, but the steel says 
this is the n amount of time that this, the virtual processor is sitting waiting to execute an instruction because the hypervisor that it's running on isn't giving it any 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 service. So uh, sitting on Amazon, this machine that we were paying money for, half the friggin' time was sitting there twiddling its thumbs. So, yeah, depending on what you're depending on what you're putting in a cloud or letting doing as a service, you're you're you might actually be like getting a ridiculously low amount of resources for the job. Absolutely. So, that's, so I run I run the Valheim server in, on. Yeah, that's what a yeah. shared environment is, really, right? Yeah. And and these you know twelve dollar a month places, right? So, um, if Trying to think of an example here. If uh, if I want to torrent something, right? It's too easy for an ISP to be like, we don't allow torrenting, blah, 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 right? So you can go grab a seed box for like two bucks a month or something like that. And it's a similar ideal, right? Where you go and you, you pay and within seconds they've spun a thing up. But whatever your guaranteed resources are, are they really guaranteed? Because they're probably spinning up a billion of those things just to make their two bucks a month. Right. Because it's so cheap, right? The same thing and applies to some place like Amazon. Uh, even though it's a much larger scale and they have a lot more money in that pot. They're not just some guy trying to make an extra couple bucks to, you know, whatever, buy a new spoiler for the back of his car. <laughs> and here's, here's another angle. Uh, vendor lock-in. I don't know if you yep. have any note-taking apps, for example. But I'm a huge proponent of plain text wherever possible. Mm -hmm. I've started trying to use Emacs in the last six months or so. It's It's quite difficult going. It's quite tough going, but when you get in the groove for a few days, it, it is good, but then you go for you know, a weekend or whatever, or four months off work because you've had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> All these things go out the window. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you think about just notes, how many different note-taking apps are there? And a lot of them need databases. And then, you know, some specific schema corruption happens and all of your notes are toast. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I have just clear text files, it doesn't really matter what the front end is. It could be Emacs, it could be VS Code, it could be Notepad, it, I mean, whatever you like. And uh, those notes will live forever because clear text isn't going anywhere. Which I never use a, 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 a specific proprietary note-taking program. I make little text files. Yep. Yeah, I'm with you on I'm with you yeah, on that. Yeah, so I, I I agree with the concept. The problem is um, I want something that's accessible on everything, right? So if I if I'm out at the grocery store and I have a thought or whatever, and I'm not near a computer, I want to be able to pull my phone out and take a note. If I'm that's at my computer, like... I want to make the same note in the same place, right? The point I made at the beginning, where you trade your uh, data yep. and money for time and convenience yep that's where the self-hosting argument for you for note-taking leans towards use some hosted service somewhere like simple note or something like that right I so know. i've been I, personally i've been using google keep just because i've been in the google e ecosystem forever and that's right there on my phone and it works in a browser it works in any browser that i've used it in it works on my phone it works on several mobile devices whatever and the, and it's like instant you make a note and it's there it's there everywhere the downside yeah. is Google is obviously known for just like on a whim canceling a service. So I'm waiting no, for the they, day. They've never done that. Right, either. right. I'm waiting for the, There's not like a website that tracks all of them and, and tries to predict when they're going to go away, right? Um, and who's to say that um, maybe Google's a bad example, but there are plenty of other examples where companies will go out of business or they'll be mm -hmm. acquired or their business model changes. Right. And that thing that was free or was cheap enough for you to pay for it, you know, a buck or two suddenly becomes 10 or 20. Right. Suddenly you've got all this knowledge, wisdom, potentially years worth of stuff locked up in this proprietary thing that you now have either lost or can't get access to. And if you extrapolate this example from note taking to physical hardware, something like, uh, think of a good example like a light bulb for mm -hmm. example one of these smart light bulbs a philip hue light bulb has proprietary firmware on it that so long as philips hue keep maintaining and supporting it will continue to work for some amount of time but if you put yourself in philip's position 
if you buy one light bulb and don't buy another light bulb for 20 years, where's their incentive to keep supporting that 20 year old light bulb? That they, yeah, that whereas, they sold for 20 bucks. Yeah. Exactly. Whereas if I have a free and open source firmware, something like Tasmota is a great example. Uh, that that I bulb, own that hardware. That I'm not right beholden there. to anybody else's <laughs> business model. So it applies to just not just notes, but also yeah. physical stuff as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a perfect example. I have this this doorbell. And I talked about this once before on the show as well. Uh, it was given to me as a Christmas present. Somebody bought it at like Walmart. It's a smart doorbell, right? And uh, the idea is you just hook this thing up. There's a You can buy a chime that works with it. It's all wireless. You just get power to it, and it's supposed to work. Well, uh, the thing is, the way it works is through a cloud provider in China, right? So if I want to hook up this doorbell just to notify me on my phone when someone presses my doorbell uh, and sends me video of my front porch, uh, I have to go through a cloud provider in China. The doorbell was dirt cheap. That's the whole reason it was given to me as a present, right? Because it was inexpensive, and they thought, oh, he likes gadgets. He'll love this, right? Um, I don't know when that cloud provider is going to close its doors. And what happens when it does? Doorbell just stops working? Uh, what yeah, are they doing with that data, probably. right? Probably. Why does my data have to go through China to get back to me, <laughs> right? <laughs> Very good question. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's that's another great example of the same, the same deal. Um for your light bulb example, I have I have a I have a number of Tasmoda bulbs and I have a number of C by G E bulbs. And I'll tell you which bulbs, even though they were more expensive, work better with uh, with my home setup. And that's the Tasmoda ones because there's less in the way. There's no cloud provider to reach out to. There's no integration with my this or that. It's just my home assistant in the basement can talk to my Tasmoda bulbs and it works. You run home assistant. You're a yep. good man. Yep. Love, yep. We can love home assistant. Yeah, we had we had a guy on the show. Uh, he goes by the mentor or dementor. Uh, he's in our, our Discord if you... Did I say it wrong, Mark? Discord. Yeah, you did. But do I have to hit the button again? I still heart you. <sighs> anyway, um, he he uh, he's he's real hard on the uh, uh, Home Assistant. And after we had him on the show, I'm like, I'm going to check this out. So I threw it in a Docker container on my machine in the basement. And uh, sure enough, it's like, it's definitely a, a trap. You get into that. It's and a then, trap! And then it's like, what else can I automate? Huh? Now, is it a, doc <laughs> is it a Docker container or are you using Podman? It is at the moment Docker. I'm going to move it to Podman. Loser. As, well, it's currently on physical hardware, which is a CentOS 7 box, which I guess uh -huh. I could theoretically put Podman on. But You, could. Um, you, should, be, you should upgrade that CentOS, that CentOS 7 to CentOS Stream. And, did, and you, uh, did you hear that Red Hat killed CentOS? I, I've heard that over and over, and it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. All right. It's so I guess the it's other cool. thing I wanted to get your perspective on, Alex, and we this this came up when we were talking about it a couple episodes ago. Um, at what point do you consider it self-hosting versus cloud hosting? Like, if I spin up an EC2 instance that just gives me a Linux box in the cloud but I built the application or I deployed the application myself, is that still self-hosting? Or do yes. you just not care? <laughs> yes, it is. So you consider if, that self-hosting? Interesting. If I, if I have uh, SSH access to the system that is running the service, I consider that under my control. Ah, wow. So uh, I, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that being self-hosting because okay. you, 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 don't, you don't have any access to the hardware. You don't have you for me my definition for something to be self-hosted, I need console hardware root access mm -hmm. so that I can change the resources, the resource allocation, have total control of the hypervisor if it's virtualized, have total control of the hardware so I can give it more RAM or swap hardware around. The, the suit, I had exactly that situation with the Amazon box. We were running Fedora on an EC2 instance, but I, but Amazon was not, was not letting us use as much computational power as we were in theory paying for. Right. Cause we were getting. But we, that's we, where the balance again shifts between different people. And mm -hmm. my version of self-hosting is, is clearly different from yours. And, and that's okay. I think for me it's it's about being able to own the data so take it take notes again as, as an example if i'm using google keep i have zero say how that is computed on the back end or stored or backed up 
indexed, whatever. looked at. It, yeah. Yeah. If I'm if I'm hosting that on Linode or DigitalOcean or AWS, I can SSH in and I could, you know, set up a ZFS file system and replicate that locally if I want to. So that for me, any of my VPS instances, and I have two or three of those, they're all totally ephemeral. Right? If they went away tomorrow, I wouldn't care. I could spin them up again with Terraform in five minutes and then replicate the data back and I'm good to go. That for me is the definition of, of self-hosting is that I'm able to treat it cattle versus pets. I'm able to just... Okay. It doesn't matter. The so, data doesn't matter. So I'm going to put words in your mouth and you can tell me if these are words are accurate. To you, the line of self-hosting crosses with what we traditionally call today software as a service. Yeah, yeah. If if I if if I have zero control over the the back end plumbing of the service, then that's not self hosting. Okay. Okay, and that's cool. So you don't you don't necessarily for you for you well, it's that, more it's more about it's more about the data, the application layer itself, and not so much the hosting platform. Yeah, but what what about uh, the scenario that JS Carr is uh, pointing out in the chat, a colo. So if you were to pony up and pay for a dedicated colo box in a data center, presumably because you could go into that data center and unrack and do whatever you want to that piece of hardware, you would consider that self-hosting? So now we start to get a little persnickety, right? So, so how much access do I have? Do I have... I, if it's an HP unit, do I have ILO access? Like, am I, do I have God level access at the hardware level? And and chat chat might lag a little bit. Yeah, for right. me, for for <clears throat> I I would probably concede that if I had God level access to a piece of hardware living in a data center, that would be mostly self hosted. Mostly, <laughs> mostly. I mean, I'm like I'm like one of these. King James only people now, right? Uh, Self-host, it needs to be in my house where I live. I mean, that's probably not. But then you run into reliability or in my business, issues right? with electricity, with ISPs, with oh. the dog pulling out or chewing a cable. Yeah, I mean, I've right. I've been down that, this road. Like I've but, I've I've had the data center in the basement for quite a long time. In fact, for most of the time that I ran my own website, it was in my basement. For a little while, right. it was in an ISP because at an ISP that a friend ran, um, but it is a severe pain in the butt. I mean, now, having 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 uninterruptible un 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 power, having an ISP that's okay with you hosting like that, it's 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 a big deal. Not to mention cooling. Right. You get you get so, more than and, a couple and, servers, and all of a sudden you're heating up your whole basement. Right, and, and self-hosted is not always superior. Right? right, like a, like home hosted, home hosted has advantages. I can touch the server that I built. It's got pretty red lights, which you're absolutely right. And now, and and I made some changes. I've got a line of uninterruptible power supplies on this thing, and on the cable modem, and on the router. So if I the type of power I tend to lose where I live, I've lived here for ten years. This house, actually, no, my God, I've lived here longer than that. I've lived in this house for shit anyway a while i've <laughs> since 2007 yeah a little more than 10 years that's funny the that's how long is, i've lived here that's funny. i don't tend to have multi-hour power outages i tend to have five second to one minute power outages just because i'm a, i'm on a very stable part of the grid if i've got a multi-hour outage there's a tropical storm that comes every 20 years that has hit us um and even then i don't always lose power Right, but yeah, ju I'm not saying that this is always a, th that it doesn't have drawbacks and that it's better. Just in, in my mind, and I'm willing to be wrong. In my mind, self-hosted always meant that either the if you're an individual, it's in your dwelling place. If you're a business, the servers are on site. So it depends what your goals are with self-hosting. Right? If if your goal is to be able to touch the tin and replace the hard drives yourself and do all that kind of stuff I, I think your definition is perfectly valid for, for me it's about uh, solving a problem generally speaking 
um, you know, I'll run my own Unify controller, for example, or mm-hmm. I will host my own website and stuff like that. And I would rather not pay Squarespace their exorbitant fees to do that. I would rather own and host a website myself. And so it's it's just, uh, f- for me, I, I actually don't really care too much that DigitalOcean have the keys to my server, should I ever want it, because everything there is encrypted at rest. So unless they are going in to a live running server, which would not happen on the regular, I don't think, then, you know, because of encryption, there's not much to worry about, yeah, in my that... opinion. No, I, I use cool. DigitalOcean as well, so I'm... Um... I'm glad to hear you have a, a good opinion of them. <laughs> yeah, we got a, a sponsorship deal on the uh, on, on my podcast with Linode at the moment. Uh, so I currently have an unlimited account with Linode, which is a lot of fun. But uh, Oh, that's nice. But here's something I think we can all agree upon. Maybe we need DigitalOcean to sponsor Iron Sysadmin. I'll I, get on that. <laughs> I, 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 like, I like your statements about SSH access because if it's about keeping your chops up if it's about learning i i think that type of access is critical right because often in enterprise situations you don't like when i was an sa at merck and that uh, systems administrator so not sa like at red hat yeah we started in a place where we had production on site but shortly after i started production moved down to charlotte and a while after that, we weren't even allowed in the test data center in White House, and I was working remotely most of the time anyway. So I didn't touch hardware very much at all, except for my first couple uh, at the very beginning of being a Linux administrator. But we always had console access. We always had SSH. And that's honestly where you, where I think you do learn the stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, don't get me wrong. I love having a data center to walk into. It's one of the things that I miss about being in the position that I'm in now. But I get to make up for that by having a couple machines in the basement that I use as a lab. I don't run production services down there except for my Plex system because, to me, it makes more sense to have that here than it does to have it on a cloud provider. Um, but, yeah. Okay. It's... Good luck finding 50 terabytes in the cloud for the price of your server every month. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I don't know what you think I'm storing on my Plex server. You think I'm pirating a bunch of movies or something? <laughs> I thought you had your family reenact popular movies and TV shows, and they do a frighteningly good job of it. No, we know someone that does that, though. You must have a lot of drone footage or uh, a lot of photographs on there. You know, you you laugh, but the uh, the thing that takes up the most space on my Plex server, and it's really just because it's where I have the most storage, is all the footage from my YouTube channel. So <laughs> It's not surprising. It takes up probably two-thirds of the storage where my, my movies... Which, being completely honest, are actually mostly DVD backups. I have a bunch of DVDs in the attic, and I've copied them to Plex so that they're a lot easier to index and find than uh, going through the the old, you know, shelves and shelves of DVDs. I think I think we resolved that legally twenty or thirty years ago, and it was ruled that you're allowed to keep a backup. Yeah, to be honest, I don't care. (laughs) I have the DVDs. If they really want to come after me for copying them to a a Plex server in my basement, no, I think we, I think we did settle that legally. I think so too. I think so. Violating the DMC, DCMA, or whatever it is. Well, that was a stupid law anyway. So Jscar wants to know how much storage we have in our homes. I've only got like three or four terabytes, if I remember correctly. Uh, this guy's too, and it's mostly uh, full. So I'm looking at a Synology as soon as I can afford it. Probably I think I've uh, got about 150 in this house, and then I've got 50 terabytes in England. Damn, I'm a lightweight. I've Is got that just push. for offsite backup? Jeez. What well, so here? when I emigrated three years ago, I uh, just left my old server in England because I was planning to build a new one here, and then replicate everything between the two. Interesting. So is it hosted someplace in England? Like or is it in someone's basement? Yeah, my parents. Um okay. just under the under the stairs. Yeah. Perfect. Just like Harry Potter. Do the consoles count or just like because I got about seven terabytes on the real computers, which sounds like lightweight. But I don't have Well it's more than I've got. got. <laughs> we had Wendell on and uh his you know, Wendell from uh, level one techs, he uh he has over a petabyte. So oh, no matter wow. what any of us say, wow. 
We're That's puny. A lot. That's really. a lot. Yeah, the Synology I've been specking out is like more like twenty, right? So <laughs> really? I, I actually got I have a Synology, but she's a bit of a lightweight. So I've got one of their Ryzen powered uh disk stations at the minute. It's pretty great. Quite quite like that thing. And it does VMware iSCSI with a ten gig NIC too, so it's it's pretty ca pretty capable for a home lab. That's cool. Cool. All right, we've gone kind of all over the place here. Um, we've talked about home automation a little bit. So you said you're a home assistant fan, huh? You have, you have like crazy stuff going on, or is it just like some light bulbs and thermostats? Uh, I've actually, uh, the last week or so, been automating my woodworking workshop. So uh, I have a bunch of those blast gates for the dust collector. Um, mm -hmm. So the blast gate is a thing that, you know, you've got a pipe, and the blast gate goes shh to block the pipe open or closed, depending on which tool you're using. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've been doing a bunch of stuff with um, the ESP8266. I just happen to have one here Yeah, on a breadboard. Um, little Wi-Fi chip with, um, I think, 40 kilobytes of RAM and 4 megabytes of flash storage. Well, that's what's in uh, these little... bulbs, right? The Tasmoto bulbs? Yeah. Isn't it the same uh -huh. controller? Yeah. Little microcontroller with some GPIO pins. Um, they're about 3 bucks each if you buy them in bulk from China. And uh, so I've been doing, integrating my dust collection system with Home Assistant. Uh, <laughs> also, the office plant that I haven't been in my office since January. The plant in my office kept nearly dying. I kept going in there and being like, oh, yeah, I should Time water to water the plant. The plant. Uh, so I bought a capacitive moisture sensor for the soil for the plant in my office, hooked that up to a $5 USB water pump, and then wrote some automations in Home Assistant with ESP Home, flash the firmware, and then so my my office plant now waters itself. I, cool. I feel like I feel <laughs> like that defeats the purpose of having a plant. <laughs> what like, how do you mean? I don't know. I always I feel like people who like plants like them because they have a thing to take care of, right? It's like almost wow, like a I bond mean, people have it with plants hurt to have a, a, a you know a digital backup, does it? I guess uh, I guess if I had some kind of a mechanism that could uh, automatically feed my children breakfast, that would probably be a thing I'd go for, too. That would be you could awesome. Do that. Why wouldn't you, you do, do that? that? <laughs> it just shoots gruel down a pipe onto their plate. <laughs> That's terrible. That's uh, terrible. I also did some stuff with my garage door openers. So I got a Sonoff uh, SV, a low-voltage thing, so I don't have to use the MyQ app. And uh, that just basically bridges the contacts in a relay to open my garage door with an NFC tag outside my door, which is kind of cool. I think of other stuff outside of thermostats and lighting. Jscar is asking about a uh, home assistant powered bidet. No. <laughs> That's... My bodily functions are all natural. Thank you. Darling. Yeah, right. We don't need automation there. <laughs> Ah, so it sounds like you're uh, you're a hands-on sort of guy. Then you don't, uh, you know, just do the off sh off the shelf stuff. Well, no. Why would I have a three D printer if that was my game? Good point. Good point. Drone racing got me involved with all that stuff, so I knew basically nothing about electronics. Uh, I couldn't solder. I couldn't really even follow a schematic. And then with drone racing, you basically order the circuit boards from China and then solder them together with bits of wire and make make something that flies somehow uh, is and it's kind of yeah. snowballed is it just me or can everybody just sit here and just like listen to alex talk at this point <laughs> it's funny just how the fun, the fun way you say garage and schematic it's and so garage. not new jersey and, and solder yeah. Uh, garage yeah most most people don't don't well at least most people in the u.s don't pronounce the l in solder i guess we kind of do it's just much much lower key than uh no, I think it, it it's awesome. That's that's all. You know, for a language you've only had for two hundred and fifty years, you have done a pretty good job with it. Hmm. We've tried. I don't know if you call. I mean, I, usually people who still speak uh, what proper English don't think we've done a good job with it. So thank you. I, was being sarcastic. <laughs> I, I feel yeah. I feel like he was actually being very English. You're at right. Us. You're right. I'm just I'm just trying to be obtuse because it works works yeah. better that way. Dirty there's, 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 this, there's this whole bit Nate's of a, a dirty colonial in that I have to kind of play along with, which is that Britain's superior to America and Britain knows best and what have the Yanks stupid Yanks done and blah 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 blah. 
I actually really like it here. And everybody that I've worked with or met in person is super friendly. And I think I can boil it down to this statement really is that the American singular is one of the nicest people you'll, you'll ever meet. However, the American as a collective uh, yeah, we're, I think we're I, a little we're I, a little loud and messy. And... I think we just have a bad image, really. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think the mo- I, I kind of agree with 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 Alex. Like especially in person, most most Americans are folk who would give you the shirt off their back and are really super friendly. You put a bunch of them on social media and get them riled up, and they're screaming assholes. Yeah, well, so. I mean that's 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 an issue we've talked about so many times on this show. You know, you get well, enough there's, people there's behind phrase, keyboards, and it's there's a phrase from the social dilemma which I'm going to quote now, which is, "It's you versus a thousand engineers at the un- other end of this portal, and their only job is to steal as much of your attention as possible." Yep. Who do you think is going to win? Your monkey brain or a thousand smart people in California? That's deep. Word. It's true, I'm going to have to watch this show. Where'd you say it was at? Was it on Netflix? It's on, it's on Netflix, yeah. yeah. The Social it's, Dilemma. It's, it's, it's one I've been meaning horrifying. to watch, and I just haven't. <laughs> it's horrifying, but well yeah, worth I, a watch. I finally just finished The Expanse. Well, finished up till current. I suppose there's going to be more, but I'm now current on The Expanse. Oh, you're ahead of me. So uh, now I want to watch Chernobyl. And then I suppose I'll have to look up The Social Dilemma. Is it a series or a movie? It's a, a one-off 90-minute That's even movie. even better than I could do that before watching Chernobyl. <laughs> Chernobyl's great. I watched the first episode of it, and it, it really caught me. And I was, I'm like, maybe I'll watch this with my wife. And I told her about it, and we just never sat down and, d- and did it. So now I'm going to have to, like, well, I guess push her to watch it. <laughs> all right. So um, we've gone kind of all over the place. And we're we're like forty five minutes in already, which is pretty much par for the course. Um, I guess if you don't have any final thoughts, maybe you do on on self hosting or whatever. I think we're probably going to move along into a transition. So, any last thoughts before we do that? Host all your go stuff. To, go listen to my podcast, self hosted show. Right. So, how can people find? I guess self hosted show is where they can find the podcast. Uh, can people find you on Twitter or anything or? I share am that? Over, I am over there at, at Ironic Badger. The Twitters. The Twitters. An Ironic Badger. Badger. I love that. Ironic Badger. You know, I, that came about through a, an automated forum generation tool about 10 years ago. I say, it sounds and like then, the name of a release of Ubuntu. Oh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Oh, that would be great if I got one named after me. <laughs> Except it has to be uh, alliterative. So Yeah. Never going to happen. So anyway, yeah, go check out Self Hosted Jet Show. I know I'm going to, even though I haven't yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll have to do that. It sounds right up my alley, to be honest. I don't know why it's taken me so long to to check we it out. A, a 30, 40 minute episode every two weeks with uh, Chris Fisher, who is the host, former host of the Linux Action Show, and, uh, and now hosts Linux Unplugged and Coda Radio and a bunch of other stuff over at Jupiter Broadcasting. So thirty or forty minutes. How do you do that? That must be like right? an immense amount of self control. Uh yeah, it is. Because <laughs> we just keep going here. We do. Yeah. Except for right now. Because we're gonna go to a break. All right, folks. So we will see you in a few minutes. We're gonna take a break and uh we'll be back you know, whatever, however long it takes. We'll see you in a few.
Are you a fan of the Iron Scissorman podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash ironscissorman. Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash ironscissorman. And thank you.
Are you a fan of the Iron Scissor Men podcast? If you are, don't forget you can support the show via Patreon at patreon.com slash ironscissormen. Or you can buy merchandise at teespring.com slash stores slash ironscissormen. And thank you. And we are back. Minus an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Are you and, lamenting the fact that you didn't go to get more was it bourbon? Well, this is whiskey? this is Buffalo Trace. It is it's bourbon, which is a form of whiskey, and I was thinking, I'm almost out and I wouldn't mind having an angry orchard, but now we're alive again. And I probably shouldn't. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna nurse the rest of my bourbon. The tiny little bit that's left. Because it's delicious. I need to get more rye. Or really, bourbon would be fine, or whiskey would be fine. Just for the... Uh, um, I like old fashions, as, as as you know, I think, and as the show knows. I like old fashions. I've just, for some reason, I've just been drinking my bourbon straight. Maybe it's because I'm getting old. Do old people like uh, pain in their mouth? Is that how no, that works? I, I just, like old guys, I think, you know, it's a thing. You drink your You drink your booze straight. No ice or anything? No, I drink it neat because the ice dilutes it. Well, yeah, I sometimes the ice. put ice in it. The ice would dilute no, it. No, I, I, legit, I legitimately enjoy straight bourbon when hey, it's a good bourbon. If that's if that's what it's you like, experience. Yeah. I ain't going to question it. Oh, you can question it. Well, I could, I suppose. I don't know if it's really worth questioning. I'm not, asking, I'm not asking you to drink your bourbon straight, and I'm not judging you if you don't. It, uh, it's, it's recent for me, honestly. I still have my but, beer to drink. Only one and, tonight, though. And I have I have some delicious beers upstairs. I got some Angry Orchards, which aren't really beer; they're a cider. And I've got uh, oh, what's what's that Pennsylvania beer? The Yingling. Yeah, I got a, I got like a six pack of Yingling up in my beer fridge. I like Yingling. Yingling. Yingling's not terrible. No, it's and it's not like fancy pants. Like it's not fancy pants. Millennial, you know, uh, top knot bun in my hair. Fancy fancy yeah. drinking beer but i don't I feel, care i feel judged you don't have a top knot <laughs> no a man I, bun. I don't but i'm drinking that kind of beer this is a was it flying dog that yeah was, but you didn't you didn't go out of your way to like tell me about the beer you drank and describe it in ridiculous detail and as to why it makes you superior so we're good i mean i could but you're drinking whiskey straight bourbon straight so and then i would judge it <laughs> All right. All right. So this is the part of, I was, you guys might have noticed that Alex dropped out, and that's fine. We gave him the option. He's got family dude, stuff to yeah, take care of. Dude so. has a t- has a tiny uh, child process in the house. Indeed, and that's always you know it takes up some some uh, some resources. That's all there is to it. Hmm. Not just the financial kind. So lots of lots of hypervisor steel. Wow, man! I just Stone realized CD. that it has been so long since we've had so few people to display on the stream. That I'm missing like all kinds of stuff from the display here, and now I really want to re-add them. But if I do that now live, then it's just gonna, you know, it's it's gonna be this. It's gonna be me babbling while I browse through things. <sighs> let it be, man. Stream Sh- I'm just letting it. I'm just gonna let it go. All right, let so it go. This is, let it go. You this is the this is the part of the show, right? This is the part of the show where Mark sings, and I give you guys the housekeeping stuff, like announcements. Um, yeah, announcements. Patreon update. 
We've got 21 patrons for around like 90 bucks a month, which is pretty cool. Thank you, guys. And our usual read of patrons is Nicholas, Andrew. Andrew's pretty new, by the way. Um, Tatro, mm -hmm. Root is God, Bruce, Robert, Matt, David, Solemn, Trooper Ish, Linux Sys 666, Gimpy B, Mark, Dementor, uh, John the Nice Guy, Mark with a C. Oh, I forgot Mark with a K, and then Mark with a C. Mm -hmm. We had a discussion about mm -hmm. this earlier today. Yeah. Do you what? need do you need to ask with a C as well? Uh, Julius, oh. Andy, Jay, Charles, and our old buddy two two five three two. Two. I'm suddenly concerned because I'm down to 65 gig on my primary on drive c on my windows machine man and, and and what kind of world are we living in when 65 gig is like dangerously low in space it's made it's got like a red status bar i know like i know it's 65 crazy 65 right? gig 65 gig my first pc had a and 500 red. had a 540 meg hard drive I'm not taking that seriously. I'm just closing that window. <laughs> I cannot take I cannot take a computer seriously that's bitching. But, but no, that seriously, it only so, has 65 gig of space. So my main C on partition drive C. on the machine that I do the podcast and all my editing on is mm -hmm. I don't know. It's like a 500 gig um, NVMe, right? So if I have like less than 40 gig or something free. My 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 media editing stuff really severely complains because it needs all that space for cash. Can you imagine needing that much space just for the cash for audio and video? No, it needs to it needs to get a job. It that, does. That's crazy. It does, right? Is this is this part of no, that's on drive D. What the hell is burning all the space on C? Now now here you're gonna spend the rest of the show trying to clean up your hard drive. I iron sysadmin, let's troubleshoot Mark's hard drive. Well, I've got multiple drives in the thing, and my games all go on DNF. So I don't even know what the hell would be over here. Windows is a pig. That's all there is to it. Or did I did I install something from Steam accidentally on C? That's, that's probably what the hell happened. That's possible. How big is C? <sighs> well, you see, that's the tragedy. Like, C's not small. But Windows, of course, is such a damn pig. Uh-huh. Um, so let's see. If I look at the computer, C is 731 gig. Yeah. D D is 180 1. 1. 1. 1.8 terabytes. F is 1.8 terabytes and D has 237 free. F has 178 free. D My is what you keep a lot of crap around. Well, flight I, sim I guess takes up a lot, doesn't it? And and what I'm about to do, I'm about to just buy a friggin' uh SD, you know like the M2 card, mm -hmm. the, the the pure for the flight simulator and install just that on that <laughs> a drive just for flight sim uh, well it it's pretty freaking big and and it's one of my performance that's a performance block is the this is my the, my know, drives it's... my drives are gaming drives they're front loaded with ssd yep but there's spinning rust behind that and they still are a block yep uh, yeah so um I feel you because when I when I bought a machine after I left the college, uh, I bought a laptop because honestly I just prefer the mobility mo yeah, mobility of a laptop. Right and there. I'm definitely regretting that now because with the media editing and stuff that I do, it would be awesome to have more space uh, in the machine so that I could um, add like exactly like like an NVMe or a or an M4 or something just mm. to put my media on while editing, right? Because that is the number one thing that eats up resources on my machine. And if I could speed up disk access for that, then that would be a much you know better uh, experience. Yeah, I guess my question to myself, and I can't really answer this, is if I do that and I just put the pure SSD drive in, will the fact that drive C is still spinning rust cause a problem? I I like I'd like to think it wouldn't. I'd like to think that if the flight simulator is all loaded on the SSD, it would mostly be banging on that. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sorry, at the moment I'm trying to figure out what. You, you ever have that like where a browser tab makes a noise at you and you're like, what? 
was that? I remember the I remember the day when everything wasn't a damn browser tab when we actually had applications. I think it was this. Got to mute this tab. Only because when my PC makes sounds it ends up in the recording and I don't want that to happen. Okay. So anyway, that was our Patreon update. And uh, the next thing we want to talk about here is if you want to get merch, like the t-shirt I'm wearing, completely by chance today, not because Ooh, we're recording the show, <laughs> is uh, if you want to get a Iron Sism in t-shirt or a handful of other interesting things like stickers and stuff, you can head on, head on over to Teespring, teespring.com slash stores slash Iron Sysadmin. We'll get you there. I keep thinking about moving that shop to something other than Teespring, and I, I don't. Mm. Maybe someday. Why, don't, why does this look more expensive than when I bought it last time? One forty-four, and how that's much one. is it now? That's the the, the SSD drive, folks. That that's bought, that's that not the, the server. That's not the cost of a T-shirt, if anybody's wondering. No, no. We we have no. insane markup because of the expense of this show. Say <laughs> okay, the price didn't go up. Okay. All so right. at any rate, uh. no new reviews this week. Or this three weeks. It's been three weeks since we recorded. No, no new reviews. Folks, review the show, because that helps us know what we're doing right or wrong. So, yeah. Holy shit. Do those things. Mark's busy looking up prices on computer hardware. Don't don't buy computer hardware right now. I hear it's a bad time. No, no. In fact, so the SSD drive that I paid 149 for new, that's in the server now, and that was not that long ago... There's now a bunch of them used for 149 and the new one is over 300 I'm like, what? I guess the flight simulator is staying on spinning drives for a while. Yeah. yeah. Just don't try to buy a GPU. It's fine. No, I don't need a GPU. I'm, I'm good. I got a 1070. I'm happy with it. I got to be honest. I've been, I've been thinking about building a desktop, but not right now. That's for dang sure. Terrible. And definitely don't build it out of wood. Apparently wood went out of control. Yeah. People are on on Facebook and stuff like, like I've got a I've got a load full of uh, plywood. It's three grand. I'm glad I don't actually care about be- making stuff out of wood because otherwise I'd be upset. Yeah. On the other hand, steel is not as expensive as it once was. It's hmm. not cheap, but it's not as apparently not as expensive as wood at the moment. So if you're gonna build stuff, build stuff out of steel. <laughs> Why is wood so expensive right now? I don't know. It's COVID. Yeah, you can't, I'm getting tired of everybody blaming everything on it's, COVID. It's totally because of COVID. I don't know. Why That's, is wood so expensive? We're just going to ask Duck Duck Go. It's going to say COVID. Why is wood so expensive? Why is Felix okay? Why is the price of lumber so high? Ah, oh, they use the they use the P word. Partridge. What clause lumber? Uh, low, low interest rates. Building boom. Uh, demand increasing. Oh, it's supply and demand. So it's not supply necessarily because of the pandemic. Well, so production slumped because of the non-existent pandemic, according to the idiots. <laughs> and uh, now demand is high because buildings are covering. Yeah. Funny how that works. Huh. Where were we? Uh, oh right, hard drive. We Don't were, buy hard drive. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about the cost of computer hardware, which somehow went into lumber. Lumber, because it's also expensive. It's bad to buy lumber right now too. Okay. Yeah. And we did the Patreon list. We did the Patreon thing. We did the reviews. And so nice, nice people are giving us money, even though lumber and electronics have both gone high. So we appreciate you sacrificing money yes. that you could be buying lumber with. It's definitely awesome. We appreciate um, every penny. And none of it goes into my bourbon glass, by the way, just so you all know that. We could work on You'll that. Be at... I could no, send I you a bourbon I... stipend if you'd like. I don't need a stipend. <laughs> you see, people people have said, you know, why don't you try to do streaming, make a little money with that? Why don't you do a 3D printing business? Some... Like, no, that's work. I don't want obligation. The moment you pay, you start paying me for something, then I'm obligated to produce a product. That is valid. Hell with that. That is valid. I can, I, that. Can, I can tell you from opening a web host that it's not nearly as fun as just hosting shit in my basement. Because yeah. <laughs> you know, the stuff that, in my basement I can turn off when I get sick and tired of it. Cause, the hosting, cause, I can't. Because yeah. <laughs> people start that you, you set expectations. 
And no. Right now, the only expectation I have is that the Plex server will work when the kids want to watch My Little Pony. My Little Pony! My Little Pony! Yeah. Awesome. It's scary how much about that show I, I, I know. Do, do, do you act, How much do you end up accidentally watching it? To be honest, it's really... I mean... All judgment aside, it's not a bad show. The new one that they... Holy Net- crap. You're, are you a brony? No. Netflix redid My Little Pony. Oh, my God. Nate's a brony. Several oh. years ago. And that's what was right at the right age for when my kids started watching it. And it is just chock full of adult references. Not like skeezy adult references, but references that adults get. And it's got all kinds of callbacks to nerd culture. Whoever writes this show, they know what they're doing. Right there's oh a God. there's a character in there, ironically enough, called Discord, which I think they pronounce that but way. They probably pronounce it right. No, I don't know. But anyway, um, he is without a doubt, he is Q from Star Trek. Yes. He's even voiced by the same guy who played Q from Star Trek. John Delancey. <laughs> is that his name? I guess. <laughs> it's his name. That's you're the character. Brony. Oh my God. That's the character. At least you're not a furry. I'm not I a mean, brony. A brony look, I can accept. Listen, look around this office. I'm just checking Whatever, to be man. sure because they're, I they're don't think they're out of camera. There are, hey, there look, are, there are no My Little Ponies in my office. I got I got Anna and Elsa sitting <laughs> on top of my fi- of my filer, right? So with their with know. their raft still in place. Well, you know the raft made the raft ended up being a good stand, yeah. and I know I'll break I'll break Anna's feet off if I try it, and then. And you got Olaf sitting there. So the raft, the raft has become a stand. Okay. I, and and I asked my daughter what she thought like Disney would charge for this if you could buy it in a gift shop on site. A bunch. We we, we figured this would be probably like a hundred bucks. Maybe. I think I could see them charging just, 100 bucks. Just don't try it. to sell it online. You'll get sued. Oh, I'm not gonna sell it. I it, it that was a that was like a long friggin' print. That's mm-hmm. that's that's mine. You getting me? My wife's always like, oh, who are you printing that for? Me. Like, what, what, what do you mean, who am I printing it for? Speaking of it's long mine. prints, I've gone way down the rabbit hole. So oh. on, on Thingiverse, which anyone who's ever 3D printed anything... We're in chat now, right? Yeah. We're in chat? Okay. Good. Anyone who's ever printed anything knows what a rabbit hole Thingiverse is. Because you can find anything you'd ever want to print on Thingiverse. And then you will right. devote hours of your life trying to figure out how to print it properly. Reddit's unofficial mascot was on Thingiverse. Yes. Right. So, I'm in the process of printing something that's kind of creepy at the moment. Oh, it's you guys totally can creepy. See this? Um, I found a one-third scale ball-jointed doll, which I thought would be awesome for my kids, right? To if give I can them get nightmares. the thing printed. Well, so ideally, once it's painted and has eyes and hair, it won't look nearly as creepy. Um, but so I've got I've got a shoebox. Full of body parts right now. Here's, here's a doll butt. Right, again. <laughs> <laughs> here's a, a little creepy. Here's a, an upper arm, I think. <laughs> ah. ying, 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 so, ying. so the only thing that I find really weird about this doll is the size of its breasts. <laughs> See, it's a little mature for, uh, for a doll, but... You know, um, yeah. well, how old whatever. is the doll? Like, how old's the doll rep supposed to be? Well, the doll is supposed to be a fully grown woman, right? Well, then, okay, she's a healthy, fully grown woman. Which, I mean, yeah. honestly, when you think about Barbie dolls, Barbie is like this ridiculously large chested and a, like Amazonian tall uh, mm. representation of the female form as well. A little bit. It's just that this one's going to be at one third scale, which means it's going to be roughly up to like my hip. <laughs> Is how tall the damn thing is going to be. Hmm. So, um, you know, there's a lot more room for embellishments, I suppose. And things look larger because they are larger. It's a larger scale doll. So, uh, yeah, that's what I've been working on. It's taken, I've, that's probably like eight different prints so far, and I'm not done yet. Right now it's printing one of the legs. So, uh, yeah, that's been, that's been my time sink lately. Hmm. Interesting. Somehow caps lock got turned on. So I'll put a link to the uh, the Thingiverse thing for the ball jointed doll if anybody's interested in making a ball jointed doll. Um, apparently these things are like an art form. Uh, people print them. Well, people get ball jointed doll kits 
and uh, you know they paint them up to be like a form of art, and then they sell these things for that like hundreds of dollars. Doesn't, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, so that's sound... that's why the thing's a little more anatomically probably, correct than a than a Barbie probably, doll. Right? There's probably old ladies who have clubs all around this. Oh yeah, I mean, I not so old ladies. I imagine like when I was young, the thing that some girls did is bought porcelain dolls. Right, you're familiar with porcelain dolls, I'm assuming. Yeah, dude. I'm of course. I'm not a brony, but I know what a porcelain doll. Right. Is. So, like, girls would collect porcelain dolls, and they're probably about the same size as this doll is going to end up being, right? Except those you can't really play with. They're really just like things you put up on a shelf. Well, you can um, play with them delicately, I suppose. Right. So this is a this is a similar a similar thing, right? No, it's meant, I think it's cool. Yeah. I I think it's cool. Had I had a 3D printer when my daughters were younger, I might try a similar project. Like, my daughter Maggie, she'll send me stuff she wants me to print for her. Like, she sent me she sent me two things earlier today. She wants this, um, she's got a Google, she's got a Google Home, so she wants this Google Home mini stand. That's kind of cool. The, yeah, and then she, uh, her boyfriend got her an Apple Watch, so she wants this charger to hold it while it's charging that looks like a, a, a Mac Classic. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so, and that's what she does. She's like, Hey dad, here's a, she doesn't even, she doesn't even, it, she cold, she actually cold sends the stuff to just me. Here, she doesn't even say, print this. Hey dad, can you print this for me? She yeah. sends these two things. And then she does the little smiley faces with the stars in their eyes. Like, yeah. So the other thing I'm doing is, I don't know if you remember, but about a year ago, I spent a week or two, remember what happened a year ago, several weeks, probably uh, building a front bumper for my Jeep. So I can put a winch on it. I think you mentioned something about that. I'm yeah. now I'm now doing the same thing for the wife's Jeep. So and it's coming out awesome. Hmm. There 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 will be a video on it eventually. Uh, once it's I'm done, sure. I'll be sure to share it with anybody. On your if, many terabytes of, of yeah, storage. right. If anybody's interested in uh, such things, but I'm I'm basically building it out of quarter and eighth inch steel, and it'll be awesome when it's done. I promise. <laughs> but you're not 3D printing that, so no, I don't think 3D printing a bumper to hold a winch would be a very good idea. Not not with current technology. Not with current, and not or at least I, not with PLA. When I can 3D print steel, which I believe is a thing you can do, I just it, I just can't. Um, I then think they call that fabricating that. at this point. You need a, like a fabrication machine. Yeah, right. So, the, but I mean, it it basically works just like a welder. It puts down like dots of yeah of steel, yeah. right? Which is crazy. Yeah. I am. Like... There's a there's a channel I watch. This guy has a um, they call it a plasma table, which is basically um, it's the same concept as a 3D printer, except instead of printing something, it cuts things. So if, if you're familiar with like a vinyl cutter or like a laser mm -hmm. cutter, sure, it's that except it uses a plasma torch to cut steel. So, so he you cuts... had me at plasma torch, right? You know? So he so he, he cuts things out of steel with it. So <laughs> you can use that to cut steel, or you can like strap James Bond to a table and use the plasma torch to terrorize. Right, him. I man, I have a plasma torch. If you ever really, if you if you want to like replicate Tor a James yeah. Bond uh, torture uh, trap, yeah, then uh, we could we could do that if you really wanted to. Do, do you expect me to burg? No, no, I expect Mr. you to die. <laughs> And you know these moron supervillains. How how super can they be? They leave Bond in the room and then yeah, walk out. Yeah, I'm just going to go over here and have some tea or whatever while you I'll die. Come, <laughs> I'll come back and admire your body after the kill. Like Doctor Evil's son from from Austin Powers had the right idea. Let, well, let's shoot him in the head. I, I got a gun. I was going to say, I wasn't, go wasn't, right there, wasn't there a parody of this where they're like, why don't we stay here and make sure he dies? You're, I think it was Austin Powers. And I'm thinking, it was oh. Austin Powers. Yeah. No, we leave. Look, Dad, I'll go. let's shoot him in the head. I'll go get my gun out of my room. Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah that was that was excellent. And then, of course, he escapes. Well, yeah. Well, Austin Powers. Yeah. Durr. He's the Durr. hero. He has to escape. There was a, a video game. Oh, I'm going to have to look this up on my emulator now. There was a game on Nintendo called Nightshade, which was basically Nightshade. you're like you're like you're an in, you're 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 basically an investigator, right? You got the trench coat and the hat, the fedora hat, and uh, it's one of these puzzle solving games where you basically walk around and have to do certain things. And uh, whenever you get captured, 
Like this is instead of dying and having lives, uh, you, whenever you get captured, you have to escape a trap very similar to James Bond style it's traps, a trap! where it's like you're put into this thing and you're expected to solve it, and that's how you continue on in the game. And if you can solve all of them, I think eventually there's some you just can't solve. Uh, but if you can solve them, then you get to continue the game. You go back to where you were. Um, fun game. I'm gonna have to look it up on my on my uh, my retro pie. I'm pretty sure I've got it. And you may too. <laughs> it's a trap. It's a great game, though. It's a great game. Yeah. Hmm. So, what do you have going on? Three D printing like a fiend. Is I, I have been three D. I've been three D printing like a fiend. I have been. I've got this whole collection of little figures that I've printed. Uh, I showed some on camera already, and I've thrown them out the, on on the social medias. One of our fellow Tams asked me to print. He he's got some sump pumps that have sensors, and he found these little brackets on Thingverse to that the sensors sit in, and he asked me if I could print those for him. So I did that, and then he and his wife and their grandkids swung by and picked them up last weekend. It was kind of cool, or the weekend before because I was camping last weekend. And then uh, one of the guys I D and D with is prototyping this board game and he wants to make two more copies because he can't always he want he needs to ship them to demo to demo in various places it's like this 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 minotaur maze game or whatever so he's asking me if i'm willing to print out the walls and some heroes and some minotaur counters so i, I gotta run some test prints he sent me the files last night but i was playing valheim with one of our other tams and i'm like yeah, I'll I'll run a test over the next couple of days. Valheim seems to eat up a lot of your time. Not, not as much as not as much as it did, although Ajax Ajax Cat, which is his uh his handle, I don't want to use his real name, but yep. we work with him. I know you're talking about. We we beat the second boss last night after spending way too long, way too many of the last sessions getting ready. And it wasn't even necessarily getting ready to fight the boss. When whenever you kill a boss in Valheim, it upscales these random attacks that happen every so often. And we didn't want, there's this one attack that can now happen where multiple trolls descend upon your base. Yeah. Like it only, it only happens when the game knows you're in a, when the game detects that you're near your bed and it assumes you're in your base. And when that happened, we had one troll pound the crap out of our last base. And the thought of two or three, um attacking at once was terrifying so we've built up fortifications and made some multiple moats and then we've raised some stone walls so we, we think we're actually kind of ready if if this attack should happen so we killed the second boss last night and that felt pretty good cool the, ga the game i've been playing most of lately is actually monster hunter rise on the switch so if i were to buy valheim Mm -hmm. and try to play with you guys would it be this mm -hmm. the usual case where it's like oh we're 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 way above you now and you can't actually play with us or is valheim um, one of those where it, it accounts for that so so here's the thing he and i don't we don't move too fast so you could catch up with us pretty quickly what we would probably recommend that you did is you get it and you play a little bit on a solo world just to get a feel for it. Well, yeah. But I'm, I mean, you could buy it and then five minutes later be like, "Hey, I want to play on Tamland," and I'd absolutely give you the, I'd give you the credentials to hop onto it. You could, you, you'd spawn over near our near the newbie area, and you wouldn't have to come and like you could kind of blaze your own trail. The only thing you wouldn't be able to do is kill the first two bosses for the first time. You can still summon them for the first time in forever. No, um. You could still summon them because they drop some key pieces of technology. Although we could make you the stuff that you'd need for the first. Yeah, you could catch up with us very quickly. I'm now just doing verbal diarrhea. Because <laughs> I've, 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 I've wanted to, to I, I've wanted to pick it up and just haven't yet. And I mean, tomorrow's payday, so I might just go ahead and drop that that whole twenty dollars on <laughs> Valheim. It's really excellent, and again, I you'd be welcome to join us when you want to. I we're we're probably going to try and play a little tomorrow night because we 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 want to 
it, it works on a biome system. The first bi I don't want to spoil too much, but the first biome you start in is the meadows. And the first time you accidentally stumble out of the meadows into the next biome, which is the black forest, the 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 the, the raven that's guiding you, because you're a dead Viking, you're in the afterlife. Yep. Well, hun. Um, yeah. It 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 shows up and says, Hey, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your best afterlife, but if you keep going this way, your ass is gonna be kicked because you're not strong enough. And and he, he's absolutely right because what happens is you have to tech up. Like you have to build you have to build armor, you have to upgrade your armor, and then after you kill the first boss, he, it gives you it it gives you an item that lets you build uh proper pickaxes to then unlock bronze. Like then you can start building stuff out of bronze. And then you tech up and you kill the next boss. And that's where that's where Ajax and I are right now. We just killed that boss. So we can now venture into the next biome, which will let us start using iron. Because the second boss drops what you need to get access to the iron, uh, drops the technology. And there are there are fairly hefty jumps in difficulty between the different tech tech the, the different biomes. Um, and if you're not careful and you stumble in, um, you'll be pretty mercilessly torn to pieces. So there's that. That sounds like fun. It is fun. It's got, when you die, you drop all your stuff in a tombstone and your tombstone never decays, but you do have to go back and get it. And your skills, your character has skills that grow up as, that go up as you use them. And when you're killed, you lose a percentage of your skills. And then for the next 10 minutes, you can't lose any more skills if you die again. That's to prevent a total. Like, remember the the horrible EverQuest stories? You played EverQuest a bit, right? Yes, I did. So did you ever hear the horrible stories? And I don't know if these are true or just exaggerated of someone would like get their bind location set to a, to a point. But then it was not a great location because it was where monster trains would happen. Yeah. So the monsters would kill you. You die, and, and you respawn at that bind point, and the monsters don't care. They kill you again because uh-huh. you're not far enough out of their aggro range, and that's there might a, be other players. That's a real and thing. So, and you're just friggin' de-leveling down to, I think, once you de-level down to level 10, you couldn't lose any more levels when you died. I don't think EverQuest was ever that forgiving. <laughs> no, there was there was definitely a level where where you wouldn't lose experience on death. Um, and it was either level five or level ten. I don't think in the initial days of EverQuest there was there was that. You think I, you lost experience I can, in level one if you died? I can remember being low level and still losing experience when mm. dying. They may have the changed un- it later, but EverQuest un- was not a forgiving game, not at all. A- and you know what? I actually liked that aspect of it. <clears throat> Me too. And- Me too. I miss that about EverQuest because EverQuest was basically a graphical mud. And yeah. muds were never forgiving. Muds kicked your butt when you died. So, so Valheim, <clears throat> Valheim is unforgiving, but not in a way that makes you just want to put a gun in your mouth. <laughs> now, what I what I have totally lost is I had my first base on my own private world, my fir- my my first real base near the second biome, the Black Forest. I didn't realize a troll lived fairly close by. And the first time, and I didn't realize the troll could hear so well. So I run back to my base after doing something and there's a troll nearby. And all of a sudden he's running to my base. I'm like, oh, I'll just hide in the base. And all of a sudden he starts smashing my walls. I'm like, ah, he's and like, then I, nope. I, you can't I do hide. the little, I do the little kid thing where I go and try and hide under the table inside my crafting room And he just like smashes the crap out of it and I die (laughs) and I run, I run back and there's, there's the troll just like going ham on my base. And then I I waited for him to go away and it was just, it was like he destroyed my main building and there was, oh, I actually lost some stuff Terrible, And, and it was, it was, it was terrible, but it was exhilarating because it's like, you know, early Minecraft, when you would go into a cavern, a deep underground cavern, and then suddenly you realized, holy crap, I'm lost. Uh-huh. 
I'm legitimately lost. And then you hear the spiders and then you hear the zombies. <laughs> and then suddenly there's the hissing explosion sound of a creeper and you die. And all your stuff that you were wearing, all your gear, all your, it's gone because you're not going to find your body. You can't find it again. Cause there yeah. was no, this was before in game maps. Mm -hmm. you, you, you were screwed. You were, you spawned back at your bed naked. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Boy, we we off topic to there, didn't we? We went. That's that's fine. You know, this is chat. You should but, come play. Uh, you should come play Valheim with us. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to do that. I'll have to get the game and. I try think it it's out. a great. I think it's a great balance of kick you, kick you where it hurts, but you still you want to come back for more just because it's such a it. It can be super chill and fun too. That's cool. So what? Oh, do you want to hit the news button? We may as well move into the news. Hit the news button. Hmm. So, we're a little light on news today, but that's okay, I think, because, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't mind being done. So... The first one, and I, I, I kind of wish Alex had hung, hung out for this, because I, I, I'd be interested in his take on this. So you're familiar with tracking cookies, right? Like yeah. the, Like the, the purpose that they serve? Oh, yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, so um, both Google and Apple are currently working on alternatives to tracking cookies. Yeah. And um, I'm going to summarize the two. So this article is from Bloomberg, by the way. Um, I'm going to summarize the two, and I want you to just give me your initial take, because I'm assuming you haven't read the article yet. I haven't read the article, but I'm familiar with what's going on. Okay. So Apple is planning a change where, uh, and I guess this is something that's come to Safari already, but it's going to come to things like apps on your iPhone and whatnot. it's a, it's part it's part of iOS right right now. it's part of iOS iOS fourteen point five which I'm running right now right so what they're going to do is from now on when you're offered something akin to a tracking cookie whether it's from an app or I guess from websites in Safari because I think they do mention Safari in the article um, you're going you're going to have the option to allow or deny different types of tracking cookies. So very similar to how when you install, you know, a new app on your phone, it wants access to your location, your camera, and your mm -hmm. microphone, all that kind of stuff. You get to say yes, no to whatever you want. I, I think that's how it works on iPhone. That's how it works on Android right now. It does, right. Where it's like, yeah, you're a mapping app, so you can definitely have access to my location because you kind of need that to work. But my camera, you really don't need. I'm going to turn that off because why do you need to look at me, right? Um, anyway. They're going to do it. They're going to take a similar approach to tracking cookies. So that it gives the user the option to say, "No, I don't want you to be able to track my using my usage habits. I don't want you to be able to to send me customized ads. I don't want you to report back to Facebook with uh, with this with these tracking cookies. I want you to just shut up and give me the data that I've asked for." Yep. Google, on the other hand. Has a, uh, they're also revamping how they want their, I think Chrome is going to be doing this. And of course, I, I suppose Android. I don't know if they really cover that specifically in the, uh, in the article, but you can bet that if they're going to do it on Chrome, it'll eventually come to Android. Um, what they're going to do is instead of letting you pick and choose, they're going to use what they're calling, oh, there was a word here for it, federal learning of cohorts. They're calling it Flock, F-L-O-C. What the Flock? Um, oh, oh. And the idea here is that you're tracking cookies instead of saying Mark Richter likes to look for printers on Amazon or whatever. You buy a PLA on Amazon and reporting that back to Facebook so that Facebook can give you ads that are based on 3D printing and whatnot. Uh, they're going to say uh, Mark Richter is instead interested in, I don't know, whatever you would put 3D printing under it. Uh, you know, just 3D printing in general or, or creative outlets or whatever. Uh, the examples they're using are, um, like, if you go to people.com, you maybe put in a cohort of celebrity gossip fans, right? So instead of saying, Mark Richter likes people.com, Mark Richter likes Lady Gaga, it'll be, Mark Richter is interested in celebrities, 
right? Nate, so Nate it's, Lager's a brownie. Yeah. Nate Lager brownie. likes My Little Pony. Um, <laughs> My Little Pony! Or kids shows or whatever. And of course, the idea from Google's perspective is this sort of um, disconnects the person from the interest, or not the interest, but it disconnects the person from the specifics. So it helps protect identity in that way, right? Instead of saying, you know, you are a Lady Gaga fan, it's you're interested in celebrity gossip, right? Um, so that's sort of the high level of what these two are doing. I'm curious what you think of the two. So um, what I can tell you is um, the moment that I could get iOS 14.5, I did. And then I went to settings, privacy, tracking, and then flipped the button that turns it off for everything. Yeah. So rather than it nagging me the first time I run an app, hey, do you do I have permission to track you across other apps? That setting says just the answer is no. Can't, you, it <laughs> can't. The apps can't even ask me. So while I don't get the privilege of telling Facebook to die in a fire, um, you kind of do anyway. <laughs> right, but I don't get to deny it specifically. Right. So, so um, I'm a big fan. I think we have given away so much privacy, and to hear Facebook whine and piss and sound so entitled about it actually gives me a certain amount of delight. Right. So, I'll, so I'll tell you I'm that the fan. the analysis, at least from Bloomberg anyway, and from folks in the industry that depend on this ad revenue are they sort of like Google's method a little better because they get to they get to keep on doing what they're doing and people still technically get some of their privacy back. Although the EFF disagrees and says that uh, you're not actually fixing a privacy problem, you're just making a different one. Uh, no. And then, of course, from the Apple perspective, it's, well, sure, people get their privacy back, but all this ad revenue is effectively going to go away because most people are going to do exactly what you did and say, no, you Boo. can't track me. Boo who? Yeah, so I'm not I'm not defending one way or the other. I was just curious what your your uh, initial I, take was. I don't feel sorry for. I them. think I sort of agree with you, to be honest. I think that I would I rather have the option to turn it off. I think Facebook has. I, I hearing how Facebook cries like a little baby about this and knowing the abuses they've done. To me, this this is just a little bit of. Maybe it's an immature way to think about it, but, and I know Apple's not the little guy, like they're a huge company. No. But I I feel that this is not the first time Apple has done something on the side of privacy. So you here's might the thing, if, right? Apple gets your money in the old fashioned way. They charge they you a bunch it. of money for a thing, right? Some argue that it's too much money for a thing, right? Then they they don't have to buy it. Where Google gets your money through ad revenue, essentially, and they sell you that thing cheaper in order to get your your money, right? Mm -hmm. Or or to make money off of you. And I guess the question is which which way is more valid? And I guess that really comes down to a person by person thing, right? Well, so, it it is and that's the great part about competition. Right. I love competition. My vote Apple's done a few things, but this solidifies it for me. I am I I am now firmly in Camp Apple. A couple of years ago, there was that there was that uh, terrorist shooting. Yep. And the guy had the iPhone, yep. and the feds were leaning hard on Apple to decrypt it. And they defended the user. And the Apple user's said, privacy. "Yep, no, no, we can't do that." And I had a fascinating conversation on an airplane at that time. With, with a couple of guys, because we were talking about, I don't even know how it came up, but the whole encryption, and like, man, Apple should help decrypt that. You know, the government has a right to know that stuff. I'm like, really? And and they're like, yeah, you know, there should be there should be a, a special key that you can unlock it with. I'm like, really? So, so you understand that if that backdoor key exists, that's not, you know, governments will demand that key. Mm -hmm. And they're like, okay. I'm like, okay, so now imagine that I'm, I live over in Iraq or Iran or wherever. 
and I'm I'm a gay man. Yeah, I'm a gay man. No, I I I I I used Iran because I sure. can specifically use this example. They hang gay people in Iran. People don't like to admit that, but they hang gay people in Iran. So imagine that I'm a gay man. I'm texting my boyfriend because I'm using my iPhone and I think it's safe or I'm sending what I believe are safe encrypted messages. The government can decode that, arrest me, and execute me. Right. How's that? What do you guys think of privacy now? And their jaws dropped and they're like, yeah, we see your point. And, and, and so just because it sounded like it was the good guys having access to encrypted data, that's, it doesn't matter. Some things are, some things are more important. Yeah. And you it know, it's, it's to, to be honest, it's really hard to not side with the authorities in a case where, you know, we're trying to find out what a terrorist was planning. Right. right but but you're have... right. You really have to think about all of the repercussions that are going to ha- come afterward. And that's exactly what Apple did. I agree with you. Shortly after that, I bought an iPhone. Unfortunately, I just didn't like the iPhone ecosystem. Um, and that's why I switched back to Android. And but, that's okay. Yeah. But 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 that that decision really helped solidify my stance and then this this recent thing it's like okay you guys are proving once again that and if if i were super cynical i'd throw the facebook lines out about well apple just wants to generate their own ad ecosystem well maybe they do and maybe they don't but honestly facebook has demonstrated that they're assholes and they're bad at this (laughs) <laughs> and I use what the funny thing is, is I'm a Facebook user. I should probably stop using them, but I have no respect for them. And, right. and so to hear Mark Zuckerberg, the Android beep and boop and be offended by all this actually brings me joy. This sparks joy. And I <laughs> and and because I think we as a people have given up too much. Yeah. Privacy. So I have one. Will one... it will it will it actually make a difference? Like if Apple hadn't done this, would it have? Would I have stopped using Facebook on my iPhone? What? It probably wouldn't have changed it. But I like, even if it's even mostly symbolic, I, I approve. So I, I absolutely I, approve. One sort of follow up, right? And this is a this is a conversation that I've had with Jason in the past uh, around the time when things like targeted advertising really started to show up in the world. Um, if you have to deal with ads anyway. Right. So if, if you have to endure ads on Facebook or wherever anyway, wouldn't you rather they were things you were actually interested in? Eh, I don't follow it. I, I don't care about ads. I generally don't pa- don't use them. So, I mean, most I of the time them. I ignore them. Right. But there are times and I'll admit this. Right. There are times when the right ad comes by where it's like, wow, I didn't know that existed. And mm. I'm kind of glad I got this ad because. My life is better because I I know this thing exists now. It's a thing I wouldn't have thought to look for. It's a thing that came across, right? Yeah, maybe it's, it's just sort of an observation that I've I've made. You know, and 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 you might you make a little bit of sense there, but I'm the 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 evil Mark is still happy to see Facebook squirm a little bit. No, I I think I agree with that. I gotta be honest, I agree even with that. though I'm a, even though I've been a Facebook user for years. I am curious what folks are gonna do. To try to get those ad, to get that ad, to get that ad revenue back. Not my, not my monkey, not my zoo. Because like say. on, on non-targeted ads, if you ask me, are basically useless. Like I, I remember back to the '90s when ads first started showing up on websites, and they were you just like what? completely off the wall. They were just whatever ad, you know, whatever but, ad but campaign. But here's the thing, Nate. Here's the thing. Facebook knows a lot about me already. This, they're they're pissed that they can't track what I'm doing with my other applications yeah, on my phone. Right. They right. already know a lot about me. Yeah, but this so, isn't just Facebook. It's it's every it's it's every app manufacturer or app writer on the on the iOS market. Well, you know, too bad. Yeah. <laughs> too bad is right. And maybe there will be people who are like, okay, I don't mind. That's fine. Good for them. Mm-hmm. But I, I, for me, I like, I like that I can shut that type of activity down. 
because I feel like I've reclaimed a little bit of my privacy. Yeah, I mean, I don't disagree although, with you. I'm, I'm, I'm playing probably, a little bit of devil's advocate here, but I, I really no, don't I, disagree with you, it. right? I, 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 I think we should have the choice as well. And I, I'm disappointed by the fact that Google is not giving us the choice because uh, I don't know if you remember this, but they Google were the ones that led that charge when it came to app permissions. F the uh, part that, uh, the iOS would let you disable permissions, but the granular access, that came from Android first. Well, that's you know that's part of sharing ideas, right? Yeah. The part that the part that annoys me, the part that I really just shake my head is that you, Facebook seems like like it's their God given right to be able to do this, and 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 you know anybody moving against that is like a terrible person. I would argue that for the type of service that Facebook is. I can understand why they feel entitled to it for users who use the service, right? Because the service is effectively free. You're not paying physical dollars for it. The way they make, the way they pay their bills, the way that they make money is through the ad revenue. So that's effectively how you pay for it. You pay for it by giving them your data, right? Yeah. You can argue back and forth about whether that's right or not, but the way to truly tell them it's wrong is to go delete your Facebook account. Yep. But, I mean, we're all kind of stuck at this point, right? You leave Facebook, you lose a lot. Not just yeah. aggravation. <laughs> There's certain truth to that. I'm going to start my own uh, social network that doesn't mine your data. How's that sound? Good luck with that. Yeah. See, that's the point. That is the exact point. Good luck with that. That's that's the response. Because it's unlikely that anyone's going to be able to do it. Maybe, maybe social media truly is a terrible thing and we really don't need it. It really is. It's a terrible thing. However, we've been participating in social media since long before social media was a thing, if you think about it. BBS Usenet. days, the IRC days, Usenet days, message forums on the internet. Those were all social media before Facebook ever came around. And we all loved it because you want to interact with people. And that's exactly what social media gets you. It's just Zuckerberg figured out how to put it all in one place. Anyway, let's move along, huh? Sure. Move I have along. a move I have along. a slightly more somber second article, and this is that right. Dan Kaminsky. If you remember Dan Kaminsky, I don't, do. You, do you know who I'm talking about when I say Dan, Dan Kaminsky? Uh, the name is familiar. Do you remember in 2008 there was this big deal about DNS cache poisoning? Yeah, I do. Dan Kaminsky was the security researcher who discovered it and organized, basically organized a secret trust of uh, all of the different DNS vendors to try to patch the problem before going live with it, before announcing it to the world. He's, he sort of modeled the idea of responsible disclosure. He was a security researcher. Uh, and now, unfortunately, at 42 years old, he's passed away. So this news just came out earlier this week. This article is from the Irish Times because it's the first one I found that talked about it. Uh, but uh, yeah, Dan Kaminsky is gone. Apparently died of complications from diabetes. I don't have a lot of the de details there. I see that. But I recommend that uh, you read the article if you're at all interested in what happened to Dan and basically what his life was all about. Um, a big name in security. A big name. So, I'm sure he will be missed. All right, so unless you had any other news, I included an article in there about the, some information about the, uh, the DNS cache poisoning stuff that he had discovered, if anybody's interested in that and wants to remember the old days back in 2008 Di when that hit. But Di Diabetes is a bitch, man. It really, it really is. I lost a, an old college friend to it quite a while ago, and that was like, uh, but, it, but it was, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to go down that road. That's a shame. Yep. 42. It's a I know. He's only a year older than I am now. Uh, For anyone who doesn't know, I'm 41. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't have diabetes, though. Consider myself lucky for that. Well, try, try, yeah. I, I, I need to get back on the exercise and weight loss train because I've been slacking over the winter. So pandemics don't help with that either. 
you know what? I I can't even use that as an excuse because I was doing great until my birthday in October, and then I'm just like, uh, and then I just kind of slid off, and I'm up, um, I'm back up in the high two thirties. Yeah, oh, like terrible. Like November. I was at uh... I was at two eighteen. I was at two eighteen, and I'm back up in the high two thirties. Oh wow, it sucks. Yeah. Back in uh, November or so, when it started to get too cold to, to really be outside, I hate the cold. Like that's the one thing I hate about living in the region that we live in is it gets cold. Um, it does get cold. But uh, I also don't like it ridiculously hot, so I stay here. <laughs> because if you go further south, it gets a lot hotter, and I don't it, love that either. It, it's I can it's live all, with the it, cold. Yeah. But uh, it's but all, yeah, it's we all just laziness. We fell me. out of we fell out of running over the winter too, and we're going to get back into it. Um, so just bought new running shoes a few days ago. Just, I they, just, they just came get in. back and take a friggin' walk every afternoon. Yeah, walks aren't so bad. We have been I doing just, that. I've just been, lazy. been trying to get walks in. No, I haven't even been doing that. I'm just I'm just friggin' lazy. Anyway, uh, I but did by the way, this is an absolutely spec. This has been in my YouTube's favorite list for years. On honest hand to heart, I the My Little Pony Rainbow Dash. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna go far. Excellent. <laughs> Do not show it to your daughters. It's explicit. Okay. Like the language. It's you're gonna go far from the offsprings. Oh, okay. The uh, the uh, the offspring, but it's in a higher pitched voice. It's funny. You'll like it. Watch it. Did you add that? To and it's a great episode, by the way. It's two episodes really, but there's the one episode when uh, Rainbow Dash wins the uh, wins this contest. It's in the general chat in Iron Sys Admin. To the uh, to the tune of. Uh... Offspring, yeah, it's fantastic. I'll I'll have to watch it without the kids. <laughs> watch it when we're done, because they'll because they'll see Rainbow Dash Wait, and they'll want to watch should, it. I I don't know if I don't know if this will let you play it. Like like if we could do like a live like Nate, Nate reacts to. You know, yeah, like right. The, the kids do those now. I'll probably end up with some kind of a copyright strike. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. the worst part of my when I go flying. I was testing this jump seat radio, which lets me tune into local radio stations across the internet. Like it sees where my aircraft is and then it figures out. <laughs> That's awesome. Where's the internet? But, but <laughs> like, I think a copyright, I get, I get like YouTube's like, you can't publicize this video until you edit the music out. Yeah. Like when I do, when I do drunken seller radio on Pandora, it's all stuff that's either public domain or they don't care. Okay. Or, and the, or the artist gets the money, but like, when I'm listening to a classic rock station, yep. Uh, suddenly there's there's enough artists Led, who are like Led Zeppelin wants that money. Play this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, ah. And the and there's a couple of algorithms you can use on YouTube to try and like automatically strip the song out or overlay another song with it. Uh, and it's not great. So I'm like, oh well, I guess I I guess I can't use Jump Seat for things I'm going to stream. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's real. They're brutal with it. That they are. Copyright is a thing on YouTube that is a big deal. When you were telling me that you were listening to to your iHeartRadio station, I I thought, wow, that's I'm surprised that it works that way because everything I've ever seen about copyright on YouTube is not nearly that forgiving. I guess it was just you had artists that were forgiving. Well, right, the drunken sailor. It's it's like all sea shanties and like yeah bar songs and so stuff. i guess it's like older stuff or stuff that's in the public domain or whatever so you can or right or the artist is like yeah this can be paid but you got to pay me instead of the guy who's streaming it right and there's a lot of songs like that but there's a couple that are not like that at all you're just not allowed to do it <laughs> cool. i think there were there were two the last time i used it and i'm like ah oh, this is a pain in my ass because it just extends the editing process for me yep and it does and it does you're going to have to start to like uh, Creative Commons music and listen to that, which or there is you... some really good stuff out there. Or, you know, I could just not friggin' stream my flights and just fly and listen to the, just fly, you know, just listen to whatever I want because I'm enjoying it on my own. With, um, with, with, some, with some setup, you could listen to music yourself without put it sending it to the stream. I absolutely could do that. I, I, how would I do that? Because I want... I want the sound coming into the VR headset so I can hear it, but that's also where the aircraft and ATC things go. It all comes down to audio inputs and monitoring in uh It does. In OBS. There's, there's no realistic way for me to to be able to hear the music and not have it on the stream, 
but also let people hear the aircraft and the air traffic control noises too. Unless, unless I do that stuff through the computer speakers because of the way the index offsets. I got to think about it. I, I have some suggestions, but we won't do it live on Iron System. How's that sound? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so, folks, I think the show's over for tonight. I hope you, anyone who's hung Almost with us, nine. I don't know if five anyone's, Alheim. I don't know if five anybody's, Alheim. five Alheim, sure. Uh, or Flight Sim, right? Go, go for, or better yet, send Mark some money for his NVMe drive or his M2 drive. Because <laughs> they're too freaking expensive and he wants the flight sim faster. <laughs> yeah. All right. So obviously this week was thrown off, but normally if you want to watch us live, you can do so on the second and fourth Thursday of every month. Uh, we should be live next Thursday because we moved this show off by one because I got my COVID shot last week and I was feeling like crap. Well, I should say the whole family was feeling like crap. At least my wife and I. You guys all better now? We are all better. It was, uh, yeah. they, they say it's a 24 hour thing. And I, I swear it was like a switch got shut off at 24 hours. I guess that's, that's when Bill Gates toggled the switch for Nate Lager must must on the have. thing. Right. Well, so th thank you for getting them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, um, I personally feel like it's an important thing, not just because my healthcare provider is telling me it's an important thing and not because uh, I think there's some government conspiracy that's trying to force us to, uh, get some weird implant. Um, but just because I think I want to get back to normal and getting back to normal means we have to get rid of a completely based in science uh, pandemic that is solvable with modern technologies such as vaccines. Um, I really don't understand where people are coming from. Mm. It's a frustrating thing for you, too, I know. But let's go ahead and finish up with the show anyway. Uh, right, so you can find us on ironsysadmin.com or twitch.tv slash podcast or youtube.com slash podcast. All of that you can find on our website. If you want to join our Discord community, did I say it wrong? Do I have to get the, the audio sound? I haven't played it the whole show, so I feel like I need to. Discord! Uh, but yes, you can join our community. Uh, again, the link is in the show notes, or you can find it on ironsystemin.com. There's an item in the menu there for it. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Just look for the Iron System in Podcast. And if you want to support the show, you can do so by buying merch at the URL that I talked about earlier on Teespring. Uh, or you can just send us money through Patreon. Patreon.com slash ironsystemin. And you get a few cool little perks if you fall into one of our tiers uh, through that community that I mentioned earlier. And I think that is everything for today. What do you think, Mark? I think that's good. I think it was a good show tonight. I think it was felt, a good show. good to be back on the saddle. Alex was great to have on. Yeah, that was, hap fun. That was happy, fun. Happy, uh, happy hundredth show, man. You got, you I got know. to a hundred. We did didn't you ever, even. Uh... Did you ever imagine when you first started the Iron Sys Admin how long it would go? Honestly, I have no idea. I, I really had no, no idea. I did, I did sort of think or maybe hope that the show would be even more popular than it is by now. But I'll take it to be honest. We've got a we've got a loyal fan base. We've got people who are willing to literally send us money to do the show. Um, every now and then, we actually get people reaching out to to do interviews on the show, which is honestly more than I ever expected. It's it's cool. I'm, I'm very happy that the show is is still going. You know, I'm, I, honestly, I think I'm too stubborn for this for the show to die off unless I really got tired and sick of it. But uh, <laughs> so mm. far, that hasn't happened. <laughs> There's still sysadmining to be iron about. Right? There is, there is. Though I do, I do sometimes worry that I'm going to get too far from like the real world being a tam now. But I guess I'm just going to try to it doesn't, not it doesn't let that happen. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't. But no, we can doesn't. talk about that more later. Absolutely. All right, so folks, thanks for watching, and um, I guess we'll catch you in a week when we do our next show. I have no idea what it's going to be about. Oh, if anyone has any suggestions, feel free. Tell us what you want to hear us talk about, because I'm, I'm kind of dry at the moment for ideas. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody, and we'll see you in a week. Peace out, Iron System listeners.